is much to say about this product driven fake expert, but allow us to welcome Professor Mata Kluki. Uh, dear Professor, uh, please take us through your uh, team entitled Fake in Feed to Control Disease in Livestock. Okay, well, thank you very much for the extremely nice introduction. Um, lovely warm welcome. It's, it's really nice to see so many uh, faces as well, so so many familiar faces uh, on the gallery here and yeah, I'm very happy to be a part of your nice um, enterprise. I should say a minor correction in my introduction, just in case you think I'm some kind of sort of uh, <laughs> superwoman. I published over 100 papers, not over 800 papers. <laughs> 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 but um, but uh, yes, but uh, but and that has been, I should say, over over uh, um, more than two decades. But we are. We are slowly progressing this area and making good traction. And what I hope to do today is share with you some of our very recent work on using phages in livestock. So I'd like to share with you why um, we're focused in this area and um, show you some actual data to ha hopefully help inspire you to do similar studies in your um, own settings. So why do we want to do work on, on, on phages in livestock? Well, there's two main reasons. One um, is, is part of this One Health Agenda that's the focus of this forum. So a lot of the antimicrobial resistant organisms that we uh, become infected with actually started uh, with or sort of came into existence following the use of antibiotics. That we eat. So we know that um, by using antibiotics in the livestock production, the, that uh, when those pigs are treated, that you, you can draw all that. I don't know why the host keeps muting me. If you could try not to do that, <laughs> it's quite distracting. <laughs> I've just unmuted myself about five times. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Okay, I think you must be pressing something that's muting me. Um, Anyway, that would be uh, uh, helpful. So, anyways, just so to get to get back, let's look at this this overview of my of my presentation. Is basically saying that we know that um, that we generate antimicrobial resistance by using antimicrobials in livestock production. So, therefore, if we can use something other than antibiotics in the production of of, of the food that we eat to be able to treat those animals when they're sick, then we'll avoid building up antimicrobial resistance in the first place, okay? So there's a huge amount to be done in that space. Secondly, uh, we, we, we care about being able to treat humans ultimately as well. Now, there's a lot we can learn from the way that we'll apply phages when we do it in animals. So, so in my mind, the work in my group is, is split between some of the projects that are centered around human pathogens and others on livestock pathogens. But you can see there's this very nice interaction between the two in that, that for, for those two purposes, as I said, one is to reduce the, the amount of buildup of antimicrobial resistant bugs, and secondly, to learn in terms of how we use those phages. So the, the starting point in terms of isolating phages is the same, whichever, whether we go straight into pigs or, or animals or straight into humans. But there's this lovely connection between um, the, the, the two types of, of approaches. So it's been quite a synergistic and fruitful area of research in my lab for the last few years. Now, if you want to read more about the work that I will present to you today, there is a very nice book chapter that we've just published. Um, you should, if, if, um, if you can't track this down, let me know. We can send you a copy of that chapter where we talked about the potential roles of, of, in phages to reduce salmonella from poultry and swine. There's also one published paper um, and a, a, another one that's currently under review that should be out sometime in the new year. So much of this work, I should say, has been based on the work that has been uh, done by a very good, talented postdoc in the lab, Anisha Thanki. And it's going to be centered on the salmonella work that we've done. So essentially, when you start working uh, with phages and animals, you need to make sure that you have a phage product that targets all of the strains of the bacteria you're trying to kill. So we've been largely working on salmonella in chickens and pigs. Now, what you can see from this pie graph is the major serotypes, the different subdivisions of salmonella that circulate in UK livestock. So the main thing I want you to see is that 
we definitely need phages that can target all of these large chunks of the pie and preferably that target these other smaller ones as well. Um, so that's the, the first thing. And I think what you can see, these are these are like one, two, three, four, five. These are the five largest, sl largest slices of the pie. And these phages that we've isolated to target salmonella, um, I just want you to see how good they are because I've never had such a good phage set in terms of the amount of coverage that you get. So the, so the phage, so we have a set of phages and they target nearly all of the uh, strains within the major types of salmonella. So this was a good starting point. And it allowed us to then think about, well, which of the phages we isolated should be used to treat animals. And it meant that we could, we could actually select phages not just on their host range, but also on their uh, downstream properties. And one particular property that we looked at was stability. Now we looked at temperature stability, and the reason for this is, is if you want to make a phage product to give to livestock, you probably need to process it in some way. You probably need to make a phage spray dried powder uh, so you have a stable product. And this process involves heat. So we had two phages. So when we took, this is a figure here, if you look at the, um, the green chart, that's showing you six different phages from the collection that little phages that looked good in terms of their host range. And that's what happens when you hold them at four degrees for an hour. They retain, they completely, um, nothing happens to them. Now, when you hold, so hold those same phages at 80 degrees, which is what we'd like to do in the uh, heat treatment of phages, only two of them are stable. So therefore, given that we had to choose phages that kept, uh, narrow down our choice of phages, we chose to work with those heat stable phages. Now, luckily that stability translated as well to being able to the phages that were able to be dried more stably. So we dried the phages into a powder within sugars and other excipients. And we can see here these two phages here that are um, with the highest amount of um, highest value. What are those two stable phages? So these are the two phages that we decided to use in our animal trials to see if they worked. We did a lot of work on just seeing how good the phages were in a lot of different model systems before we even went near any animals. So we did work in, in, in flasks, of course, at first, and then moved on to um, biofilm models and also into these Galeria melanella, these little insect models. And what I want you to see here is when, when we gave uh, the insects salmonella, they turn black when they're dead, they die. But when we treated them with different combinations of our phages, they stay white. So essentially we showed in this very primitive animal model of if, that the phages were very effective. And that gave us the confidence that we could do a natural trial in animals, higher animals. So we were able to powder the, the phages and make a, a phage feed. So there were a lot of technical problems we had to solve with that, but I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into that in too much detail here, although I'll happily talk more about it if anybody would like to know. And the idea was we would take our, our feed that contains the phages and we would feed it to the pigs. And hopefully we predicted that the, the when the feed got to the guts of the pigs, the phages would remain there and then they would protect the pig from salmonella infection, which we secondarily gave the pigs. So it's quite a simple trial. This is to show you the design of the trial. We had four arms to the trial. We had pigs that were untreated and unchallenged, so they were just control pigs. We had pigs that we gave salmonella to and gave phages, that's group number three. Uh, group number two, we just gave phages but not salmonella. And then uh, group number four were the group that we both gave both salmonella and we treated them with phages, okay? Sorry, three was um, just given salmonella and no phages. So that's our four controls. So quite a simple trial. Um, the salmonella was given orally and the phages were given in the feed. And it's a relatively small trial just uh, with well, we, uh, more or less five, five pigs per group. And just to show you very visually, you can see that the animals that had the salmonella phages in their feed had much, at the end of the, the experiment, had much less swollen intestines than those who didn't have. Now let me take it off this gory picture and show you some numbers um, in terms of what we could see when we enumerated the salmonella. Now this is to show you one of the nice things about working with salmonella is that it grows black colonies on a selective media. So we were able to enumerate salmonella throughout the trial. And I just want to show you two graphs. This is the first one, and it's showing you the amount of colonization of salmonella in the animals in different parts of the gut after the experiment finished. And I just want you to see that in most areas of the gut, the animals that had the phages, you can see that corresponds to them having less 
salmonella colonization there, and that also translated to less disease. So the second thing we were curious to see was, do phages amplify at the site of infection? So we, we know that we're giving phages in the feed. Sometimes we are limited, in this particular case, we were limited by the amount of phages we could get into the feed. But we wanted to know, well, when the phages are there, are they going to be multiplying at the site of infection? So you all know, don't you, that's, that's one of the things, the benefits of phages is that, is that we know they amplify at that infection site. And this was very lovely data for us to see. We can see that in all the areas of the gut. So group two just contains the animals that were given phages. So the phages are getting to the gut, which is one good thing. And we can see from comparing that to group four, which were the animals that had salmonella as well. So when the bacteria is there, the phages can replicate. So we sort of see more of them. Okay, so this was, it was just a small study, but it allowed us to see, oh, that the, the phages appear to be effective in reducing salmonella numbers. They also reduce the amount of shedding of salmonella from the pigs as well. And they're clearly amplifying at the site of infection. So this gave us the um, enthusiasm to, to then try a larger trial. Now we wanted to look at poultry because for the poultry industry has a major problem with salmonella and we really would like to do something to, to reduce the amount of antibiotics given to chickens and to be able to provide producers with an alternative. So we used the same phages and the idea really of this trial was to see if can we put phages into the feed and reduce the colonization and the shedding of birds that were given salmonella. So it's a much bigger trial now. We can see we used nearly 700 birds this is how we received them, little tiny chicks. And in this case, we actually did a slightly more complex study in that we had three different doses of phages. So we had the control animals, and then we had the ones that we um, that just had uh, salmonella, as in the last study. But then we also had, one that in terms of the animals that we gave phages to, you can see we gave uh, three different dosage dosage of phages and the dose that we gave them was the ratio of phages in the feed compared to the inoculum of salmonella that we gave them. This is just to show you how they um, how the facility um, operates so we have seven pens in chickens in each different pen and then there, we're super super careful as well so the animals that are having phages are nowhere near the animals that are not given phages in the feed and nobody's allowed to walk from one room to the other so so the facility is, is, is a brilliant facility it's just um not very far away from where my lab is. And um, they're, they're really, they're just, the scientists there are brilliant to work with actually. They're, they're very good at doing these, these types of trials for all sorts of things. So we were able to slot our phage study into a very nice big body of knowledge as to how to do these actual trials. Now, in terms of um, the, the specific trial in the chickens, the, we gave the birds salmonella at day four. This is an established model of disease. Um, and they were given the feed throughout, as, as soon as they arrived, we embedded the feed into the, the phages, into the, the different, all of the different feeds that they get. So in Britain, probably in most places where, as well, where in, in, in Africa where chickens are produced commercially, they, poor things, they only live actually for 42 days until from chick to when you consume them. That was the length of our trial. Then we collected uh, samples of, from, from their feces throughout the trial and then at the end we did um, we sacrificed the birds to look at how much colonization they had. So let's show you some of this data. I think let's just skip all right through to, well first of all I'll, yeah, I'll explain that these are the number of colonies, our salmonella, and these are the days along the bottom. And the thing I really want you to see is look at day 42. It's really fascinating. You can see that in all of the cases, so these were birds in red just given salmonella, and then the um, blue and the pink and the green are where they had phages. And you can see this is the lowest dose of phages, all of the salmonella has been removed. So, and so this was with quite a lot of birds, um, so it's highly robust and repeatable. Now those, those phages that had the lowest dose of, um, sorry, those birds that had the lowest dose of phages were completely cleared from salmonella. So I don't know if somebody's got their microphone on, I don't think it'd maybe stop there. <laughs> Um, so, in a way, this was a little bit counterintuitive, isn't it? Because you might think that the more phages, the more effective. But in terms of just removing salmonella, the lower dose is effective. We can we can talk more about that. But I I assume what's happening is that 
if, if you just have a big burst of phages at the beginning, it's perhaps harder for those phages to find a new host, whereas the lower dose is allowing the infection to systematically slowly clear. The final thing I want to mention about these uh, studies is you might be thinking, well, okay, that is good. They seem to be, um, phages seem to be effective, but how, why, or would you just generate resistance straight away? Um, because that's really the last thing we want to do, isn't it? We want a, an effective antimicrobial. So if you just immediately drive phage resistance, then that would be suboptimal. But fortunately for us, this is not the case. So the cocktail we used had our two heat stable phages in, and what I'm showing you here is the plaquing efficiency of our phage, two phages on the wild type salmonella and uh, on salmonella that were isolated. So this is at day 14, but we had the same results from every single time point that we tested throughout the trial. And all I'm showing you is that there's no statistical difference on the salmonella, the colonies that we found in chickens, regardless of what dose of phage they'd had, in terms of how effective the phages are at being able to plaque on all these, these different strains. Okay, so we did not see any naturally evolved bacterial resistance to these phages in the duration of the trial, and that refers to either phage. So just to um, summarize for you the, the, the main points of the presentation, I've shown you that uh, phages have effectively reduced salmonella colonization and shedding both in pigs and chickens. Um, and in, with all the uh, three doses of the uh, phages, they, they worked well. And we could see that the phages were A, passing through the guts and B, multiplying at that site of infection. And we didn't see resistance building up. So all in all, um, I hope you agree that the phages look extremely promising as a means to integrate into good animal husbandry in order to reduce the amount of AMR and provide something for our food producers to be able to treat their animals. Uh, with that, I would just like to acknowledge my lab, particularly Anisha, this is Anisha here, who uh, did much of the work that I uh, presented and really, really drove every every part. So she's been in that, involved in that project from the um, from its inception. So from finding the phages to um, really driving a lot of the work in those animal trials. So and thank this is this is this is just to show you this is how we've been operating for our lab meetings over the last couple of years. The lab has been functioning at least for now the last year and a half. So we are we think things are still a bit crazy here, but. Um, we've been able to, to, to carry on working as, as, well, as best we can. Okay, with that I shall finish and happily take any questions you may have. Hi Mother, this is Angela from Kenya. Hello. Hi, um, uh, let me see if I can just... That's me? <laughs> Hello, can see you. Now. Hi. Um, uh, a question uh, from a few people was, uh, was the, what is the stability of phages in the feeds tested? Yeah, so this, the phages are, seem to be very stable in the feed. We've, we've tested the feed now for um, up to, um, I think the longest we've done is uh, more than eight or nine months. So it's, it's basically the, the, the phages are stable for the whole duration of the, of the feed product. So this was this was really um, you know that this is great and this is stored at ambient temperature that the farmers would store it at. We had some issues initially trying to figure out how to put the phages into the feed. So our initial idea was to put it in with what you call the premix. So the way they make the feed is they have the bulk, you know, the sort of grain that they put in, and then and then they they add the vitamins to it. So we thought we could add the phages to the vitamins and mix it at that stage. But they um, their phages are deactivated in that in that premix. But if you put the phages in, um, we've tried it in different ways now. But if you put them into the matrix of the feed, it, it's fine and they re they retain their stability really nicely. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mata. Uh, it's a long time since we met. This is Dr. Tunga Nyachio. Uh, let me put my video so that I can I can greet everybody. <laughs> long time. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, as usual, the presentation is uh, very catching and uh, is very interesting. I wanted to ask about uh, uh, the plans for commercializing 
the, your venture because already it looks promising and it looks working. Yeah. So I think uh, I think now the next step should be upscaling and commercializing commercializing it, and uh, also you can comment on uh, on what you think whether we can also have it in in Africa for the purpose of uh, also helping our chickens and pigs. Yeah, the- no, I mean there there are different ways to, to do the commercialization. The way that route that I'm choosing is to work with a feed company. So at the moment we're in quite um, advanced negotiations, shall I say, with a with a British feed company that will make the feed for British farmers. So it, in some ways it makes sense. You know, I, I have the phage, the phage expertise, but for, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, it makes sense to therefore work with a company with all, with all that feed expertise. So we've learned a lot from working with them to do the trials. So we worked quite heavily with them um, in terms of the design of the trial. We had feed specialists and we had clinical um clinical trial design specialists and and people that are used to um, um, designing profiles of feed in all sorts of different ways. So the company worked with us even to do the trial work and and then they're working out how they will um, take that product forward. So one of the major limitations for them, um, which would be the same for you in Africa, is the regulatory pathway. And um, this depends a lot on how whether phages are going to be regulated um, as a feed additive, which is currently what many companies are doing, or whether they're going to be um, regulated as, as, as a as a veterinary product. So it's, it's <laughs> these things sound quite sort of. You might think, well, wait, what does it matter? But it does matter because the, the path to actually having your product available is is different depending on which of these paths you take. Um, so, but anyway, so, that, so again, by working with a the company, they then have that expertise because they're quite used to regulating their other products within their feed. Like the feed often contains things like enzymes to make phosphate bare available and other things that have similar journeys. So yeah, so I, I, I will commercialize that with a, a alongside a company. Um, um, and then in terms of how, how you would use the um, pages in sort of small scale farmers, for example, in Africa, I think that you could you could do that in different ways. You could work with a probably the best thing would be for you to work with local feed manufacturers that um, are, pr- are producing feed, or potentially as well the product might work as a as as, as a liquid to put in the water. If you had a, a powdered phage product that you could dissolve in the water, maybe that would be a, a, an, an alternative route as well. P- people are also investigating that when it comes to phages and livestock. I think there's different different delivery methods that will work in different conditions and has to has according to how chickens are produced. What about the cost? Uh, because uh, you know people will be comparing the cost of uh, phages vis-a-vis the cost of antibiotics. So uh, they should, what do you think? Yeah. yeah, they shouldn't be, for these purposes, phages shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be too cost prohibitive to produce them. So for example, there's a, a very nice company in Scotland that I work with quite a lot and they make phages as um, to prevent the rotting of potatoes. So they, they, I think we've talked about these ones before, but I found it a really interesting product. What she does is that she works with the potato growers. So it used to be that at the very last stage in potato production, you sprayed them with chlorine and now you spray them with phages. Uh, and then if you look at the data in terms of the amount of rotten potatoes that people bring back to the shops, so people in Britain are very uh, good at complaining, they don't want to have any rotten potatoes, they always bring them back. So if you just look at this data, the phage ones are more effective. And what she says is that she can produce the phages at the same cost that the chlorine wash would make. So, so when, the, when a phage is being used as part of a feed product, you don't have to have really extreme purification. It's the, it's the purification in general that drives up the cost um, of phages, but in, inherently they're not an expensive thing to produce. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so we do have a few questions on this other side. Um, what is the cost of and the parameters of, sp- of spray drying and what are, or is there tighter losses when you're yeah. doing that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, so we, we have a small laboratory scale spray dryer, and I think that cost around it's quite it's about maybe thirty thirty thousand pounds, I think, to, to, for this small small one. But it's a kind of it's like lab lab. It's quite high specs. It's designed to have a lot of control over. 
um, what we then did to make enough phages for the uh, for the um, trials is we used a commercial dryer. So we just used a spray dryer of some that that, that was uh, that people had. People were using it to spray dry milk and seaweed. So you'll find people spray drying other products in Kenya, probably things like coffee. And so if you can work, if you work with people that already have the spray drying technology, they might just, what we, we did was just, we just paid them a small amount of money to allow, to allow us to use their spray dryer. Now there were some issues <laughs> with this. Um, the phages would have been deactivated at the normally at the temperatures that they spray dry other things with because normally you have what's a very high what you call an outlet temperature so the stuff goes in there and then you evaporate it really quickly at high temperature so we had to change all their parameters which it was two um, brothers that ran this factory they were very tolerant of us. <laughs> now in terms of in terms of losses yes we did we did have losses and one of the things we would do we're sort of in doing at the moment is trying to uh, make that process more efficient. Yeah, we lost because we were, we, we ended up with putting a, a lower titer of phages into the feed than we'd intended to because we lost, we lost phages at that stage. So once they were in the feed, back to the question earlier on, they were completely stable, but we did lose, we dropped titer at the, at the spray drying stage. So I'm sure that's something we can optimize further. All right. Is there is it necessary to test lysogeny of phages for use on farm animals? Yeah, I think so. I think that, that the more you can do of the phage selection, the better, because very quite easy. So it depends what disease you want to kill in your animals. But things like E. coli and Salmonella, um, they're quite easy to find phages for. But finding the right phages is, is totally critical. So you you can now test. You would test for lysogeny. You test to look for virulence genes for antimicrobial resistant genes. So you'd, you'd take look at the genomics of those phages quite early on, but also phenotype them. So really study the way they interact to make sure you choose good good phages so yeah yeah a question from Lillian is uh, if uh, is phage shed uh, in animal feces and if so is that an environmental concern or is it a benefit well that's a brilliant question Lillian <laughs> yes they are and I don't um I don't know could be either. We're doing some experiments on that actually at the moment. We have a, a grant funded by the UK government to look at the implications of this because because at some level you think it would be good, right? Because you're naturally then um, reducing the amount of um, bacteria in the environment associated with those animals. Now it might be it's probably really fascinating, for example, looking at it with you compared to us because you've got warm. Your temperatures outside are probably much more. Uh, much closer to the animal's internal temperature. So you've probably got very different dynamics. If you're growing chickens outside in the UK, it's cold. <laughs> so not, the bacteria are pretty, um, they're not very active outside, uh, outside the animals, whereas you would probably have a different dynamic. So I think there's a lot of scope to do more experiments in this area to determine the impact of phages on the natural microbiota and how that drives and interacts with with pathogens of interest. I, I think that's a really it's a really really interesting and important question. Yeah, and so the two phages you identified that were hit stable. Yeah. What makes them stable, and can this be engineered yes. into other phages? Yes, that's a, another brilliant question. Um, yeah, <laughs> what, sorry. No, I'm saying that's from Lillian, I think. Uh, another, another, very many questions. Another, another good Lillian question, yes. Well, so the what, what was quite, in a way, lucky more than anything else was that when we compared the genomes of the heat-stable phages to those that are um, heat-resistant, there are very few genetic changes between those two. And um, what we think... Um, the, the genes that they, that they encode seem to be um, a high... Um, hydrozyl glycolase. So we don't quite know what this enzyme is doing there. It's quite a wide family of, of enzymes that you find throughout bacteria and other, other ones have been seen in phages as well. So we assume it's poss possibly not got that actual function in a phage. It's maybe something to do with the stability of the capsid, but we, we are trying to do some more work to look at the mechanics um, of, of this to figure figure out why, but we have actually a very nice natural system where we've narrowed it down to the fact that it, it, we know we know what the what the gene is that encodes that feature. Now, Asta, can you can you engineer phages phages to have that property? 
um, possibly, that's, that would be really nice. But what is, um, these family of phages are, um, they're quite distinct from other from other salmonella phages. So not there aren't any other salmonella phages that are outside this this particular group that have um, that protein. But I think by by understanding the, the mechanics of stability in one system, perhaps we'd be able to identify um, other sort of homologs or um, parallel approaches that we could do to engineer stability. And I can imagine it, yeah, in, in, in terms of going forward, being able to change that um, in a wider group of phages would of course be really advantageous. All right, the last question is, rather than using the whole phage treatment in treatment of salmonella shading and decolonization, are there any ongoing research in terms of lysines? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's, it, it, oh, with, with phages, um, license are being investigated for many indications. I'm not aware of anyone looking at it at specifically in salmonella and livestock. I, mean, I think it is, an, it is a case where having that natural amplification of phages is, 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 really, um, is really useful because I think if you think about the way phages are being used, we're not actually using license as a treatment. What we want to do is if, if, you're, if you're giving phages within feed to prevent infection. Because salmonella, you, you just get salmonella infections all the time when birds come through or lizards and things crawl over with it. So if, if you're using phages at a low level to prevent um, infection, then the lyc license wouldn't be as useful in, in that way of using them. I could imagine the license would be more useful if you have a, a, you know, a chronic outbreak and you need to save a flock, they're, then they're gonna be useful at, for, for that purpose. Yeah. Thanks, Martha, for your time. I'll hand it over to Rita, Dr. Rita. Yes, uh, Prof. Martha, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, it gives us hope when we get to hear that you are progressing into commercialization. And I guess most of the no novice or early stage career uh, phage researchers in, on the African phage forum probably are striving for that. So thank you so much. And thank you so, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to give us the talk. So moving on is the discussion on way forward about the future directions from, for African Phage Forum. Um, again, back to the theme of the African, of the, the theme of this symposium was basically to see how we can forge up um, um, step forwards um, for the African Phage Forum. Um, like I had mentioned to you earlier on, and on Monday, that it's a forum that is made up of, um, say, three categories. We have the novice, we have the early, and then we have the mid, um, the mid career stage phage researchers. So pretty much most of us are in the early stages of our research. We saw that we had a huge, comp a huge um, composition of them being students, a few of um, PIs and, and phage scientists. And then when we asked the question, when we, when we, I also presented to you some findings from the survey that we did, we also found out that most of us were either characterizing or isolation, then you had a very small percentage that was in the formulation stage, I guess, probably almost to the commercialization stage. So you find that there is quite so many gaps um, I know most of them were also highlighted by many of the members funding, access to equip to, to advanced tools. Um, others would wish to have collaborations with advanced um, laboratories and all sorts of, of, of gaps. So this is at it is at this point that we ask, you know, we we ask we, we ask right now, but we also ask that they, you know, P, um, members and or the attendees of this symposium to sort of reflect and think about how African Fetch Forum, the umbrella that brings researchers together in Africa, how we can also move forward, how can we work with the advanced, um, advanced nations to sort of bring about a global, you know, contribute to the global growth, but as well as the national growth as in specific countries. So this can be done by raising of hands and or opting to open up and have just a discussion. Or if you can't, then you can post, you know, um, you can post the conversation um, via the chat.
Uh, thank you, Rita. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think, uh, rightfully said, one of the purpose of this meeting is uh, actually to put forward some kind of uh, way forward on what we need to do together as members of African Faith Forum. And uh, like you have already mentioned, is that uh, there was that questionnaire that went through uh, and many people already filled it. So I think we already know the challenges that people are facing. And like you have said, funding was one of the challenges, capacity building. There were issues of uh, <clears throat> awareness, like there are many people who are not aware of uh, what phages can do, especially the policy makers and uh, maybe top personnel in the government and so forth. So I think uh, we already know the challenges and the problems that we have. So maybe the discussion of this forum is trying to find uh, solutions of those uh, challenges that we already have. <clears throat> and uh, I went through the, 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 the draft paper that uh, we were trying to, to make and I tried also to, I try to put some kind of solutions uh, maybe a few of them, and probably we can learn others from this forum through the expertise of uh, the advanced members from the West who have actually done a lot of work on, on research. I think one of the issues is uh, we need to find a way to create awareness, and awareness is always uh, very important, especially in uh, looking for funding uh, from our government. It is not easy to sell something to the government which they are not aware about. First, you have to spend time educating them. And second, <clears throat> uh, they have again to try and prioritize it. So I think one thing that uh, African Forge Forum should be able to do is provide a framework that leads to sensitization of the phage research in Africa as an alternative to antibiotic resistance. The other thing, eh, which I think uh, maybe we will have discussed in one of the forums, is collaboration. You know, the issues bacterial phages. So I think that is the first thing that we really have to think about and, and really work with um, our governments, work with ministries, work with, you know, have inter-university um, connections so that we have a, a louder voice and sort of try to create awareness and sensitization before we even start thinking of, you know, marketing of products because when they hear bacterial phages and we define it as a virus you know there's a stigma that is associated with you know the word virus and when people hear virus they'll just think of covid you know and and that 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 gets a backlash you get a backlash for that so yes uh, uh, creating awareness is there anything else that you know um we can learn from the experts because I mean, since Monday we have heard from, I mean, since the beginning of this year, African Faith Forum has, um, has, has um, created platforms where, you know, experts come and, and from, especially from the West, a few from Africa and have come and talked to us about their works. And we could only just look because we realized that they were very far from us. And yet, you know, we want to collaborate with them. We want to talk, we want to have conversations with them, but then we realize that there's such a huge gap. So, and again with the Afri and again with the symposium, the same thing has happened. We've invited guests, distinguished guests, and still they have spoken to us about their works. You know, they're either at commercialization or they're almost to commercialization, or if it's really the genomics, it's really the advanced way of genomics. So again, what do you think we can do as African Fed Forum to sort of 
come up from the big percentage of the basics to start moving now towards um, uh, towards commercialization of you know the products. I mean, I, I think I think Rita that your um, the gaps maybe not as big as you think it might be. <laughs> really? <laughs> like I feel that, yeah, because if you, I mean, I feel like we're where we are in the UK. We, we're still we're totally we're doing every. I mean, I'm probably within the UK. What we're doing is probably the furthest ahead of any group, you know. And, and this company is struggling what to know what to do. So I think that I think that we're we're a little bit ahead. And and, and I think probably the way I can and other people that are further ahead can help you is in a way by just telling you about the partnerships that we've made that have been quite quite useful in order to progress things. And then presumably you can also make your own sort of similar sets of, of partnerships. But I think that we're, um, you know, it's, the technology is not like it's established really well in other countries. It's just as perhaps, I mean, well, there's, there are different things to unpick in what you said. The genomics um, is one set of skills. And then perhaps mm -hmm. and, and there's specific people. So for example, in our group in Leicester, Andy Millard is brilliant at um, at mm -hmm. and genomes, but he's been making all sorts of tools to make them accessible. So there's something in the next issue of Phage that's about to come out. There's some open access papers taking you really clearly through how to do the genomics at a level that you'll, you'll I, I'm completely confident you'll be able to <laughs> replicate what we've done <laughs> to be able to annotate your genomes just as well. So I think those things are quite easy because we can help each other and we can put you in contact with, you know, you're welcome to, you know, people are welcome to, to, to follow the protocols and things that we've openly published and we can help ad advance those that, that knowledge but then in terms of the commercialization I mean I think companies in the in, in the west um, are still trying to f figure out exactly how phages will be used as well there's I know there's quite a lot of conversations going on with the regulatory bodies there's a, a Polish company called Proteon that I think is the furthest ahead in terms of getting a European product um, to go into livestock uh, regulated they get there they're finally quite close but um, in a way, what, what the thing that you're doing, which is accumulating your biological resource and under, understanding that biology, that's the part where there's not, there's not so much cost associated with that, but you, you, that is the key thing, because if you don't have that, you can't do anything. So, <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's really good to start building up these other relationships, but you are, um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think that, I don't know if it's a positive, I don't know if I've said it's positive or not, because... <laughs> Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> just yes, it is. Yes, it definitely it is. I mean, because through partnerships, we get to access, you know, um, all, all the tools that we can't access, you know, around here. We have a big problem of infrastructure. And that was also one of the challenges that were raised, the laboratory infrastructure. And when someone says laboratory infrastructure, um, I guess, um, um, Prof. Clock, you have an idea <laughs> because you've come to Africa and you have, you know, conducted um, the global health, the, the fake global health trainings, and you probably have an idea, you know. Um, we tend to lack, you know, some of the, the, the advanced tools and you find that you've, that most of us will probably, an example, will characterize the phage, you know, in terms of the stability and, you know, identifying it, but when it comes to the genomics and imaging, there's, that, that's another story. And, and I welcome, I really, I'm really uh, uh, grateful and thankful when you say that, which, you know, when I, your, your, your submission, that let's seek out um, North-South uh, South partnerships and that, you know, uh, many of you are willing to, to, to give us a hand at that. So I think members, you know, that is something that, you could think of, I mean, it requires your input, you know, um, it requires your input. So not South collaborations, that is so good, but also inter-country. Inter to help each other. Um, yeah, so thank you, Martha. I can see a hand from Jessica. Jessica, please, you can go ahead. Jessica Nakavuma, Professor Jessica Nakavuma. Hello, Martin Rita. Uh, I thank Martha for that insightful presentation. Uh, it gives us hope that we can get there. Definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm also about collaboration. Uh, there is this mutual 
mutual transfer agreements that are needed if we are to send our isolates for further characterization, mm -hmm. which is also happening within the African continents. Uh, I think maybe as the Africa Fiji Forum, we should push, is it through African Union or I'm going too far, I don't know. We, we should push for the scientific community to, communities to have a way of how easily we can uh, collaborate amongst ourselves, leaving out or getting those hindrances away from our progress. Because um, I know like whole genome sequencing in Uganda, you can be charged $150. Whereas it, uh, I hear in China, you can get it as easy, eh, as low prices as low as $30. So you can imagine that, that um, and yet we are, we lack funds. So I, I think uh, the collab in as much as we, 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 there is collaboration with the Western countries and they are really very willing, but we should also have that bit of collaboration and uh, um, work on those hindrances that prevent us working within uh, the African countries. That is my uh, contribution to this. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Jessica. You mentioned mutual transfer agreements. So if one asked where could they find the mutual transfer agreements, because honestly, um, I, I see most of us going that direction where we have to depend, where we have to collaborate with advanced um, labs to, to help us with this aspect of characterization. Do you have an idea? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, yeah, once you, like in Uganda, once you have your, um, your, your, your research registered with the National Council of Science and Technology, that's where you seek this mutual transfer agreement to get permission to move your biological material to elsewhere. Otherwise, we are just, is, is it sneaking, sneaking out with our samples? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, Rita, no, maybe. Okay, Dr. Tonga. So thank you so much, Prof. Jessica. Maybe Dr. Tonga, we can, since you're back, you can continue from where we stop because you sort of, we lost you. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is Africa. <laughs> Africa's <laughs> issue, uh, uh, there was power fluctuation and uh, something happened and I disappeared. Anyway, thank you very much. Just to pick up from what uh, Professor Jessica has just mentioned, <clears throat> the issue of material transfer that is possible. I think uh, there are systems in place for every country and that we can always do. And I think is also one of the ways for learning because uh, if you have somebody probably going to Europe or America to study, two things you can do, you can go there and work on the materials that they have in their own country, <clears throat> but also you can have your materials from here go with it and uh, characterize on the other side. So that is possible. On the issue of capacity building, I think the issue of collaboration here is very key and I'm sure it has also been mentioned that uh, we have challenges here and there for infrastructure, <clears throat> but infra infrastructure is not the only thing that we need, uh, it's also the knowledge. So once you have uh, collaborations, it helps us build capacity in terms of knowledge, so that uh, we have uh, uh, knowledge transfer, which is very key for the work that we are doing. And uh, I can say, for example, from our lab, the people that uh, we are working with, actually they have gone to other various uh, labs abroad. And uh, when they come back, they come up with the skills and that has actually helped us to establish our lab. So I think, uh, the African Faith Forum should be able to be like a link to network Africans with other more established labs so that we have a transfer of expertise. And, and also, we as uh, Africans, I think also we need to put our house in order in terms of uh, what we are doing, what we want to communicate, how far are we in terms of our research, so that when the world out there 
gets to know that uh, we are doing something that is uh, heading to a good direction, for example, to commercialization, I know there are many investors who would like actually to support. So I want to hope that African Faith Forum will also be a voice on uh, what we have done. And, and one of the way is actually consolidating like what we have done, writing review papers, uh, appearing in me media interviews, local and international media interviews, and speaking on the issues that are actually affecting us. And uh, in terms of commercialization, I think uh, uh, though everybody aspires to be there, but uh, it takes time. It takes time to reach there. You can so see, for example, Professor Mother has done a lot of work and is now she's moving to commercialization. So I think uh, let's not jump, uh, let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's build uh, things on the ground and start progressing in the right direction. And I think in my view, where we are, we are already doing that. So that's what I wanted to contribute. And maybe I stop to leave other people to also contribute. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tonga. You bring a very good point on knowledge. Um, I think Fages for Global Health has done an impressive work on that. And I am hoping that um, once they, they are finished with Asia, they will come back to Africa. <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> the Prof. Martha shaking her head and saying yes. <laughs> I hope you'll come back and, and share more of that knowledge because I think most of us really, that is where we first had, you know, uh, a skill set. Mm -hmm. Phage biology yeah. and phage bios and, and, and phage basic, um, basics. And again, Dr. Otunga, when you mentioned that um, we shouldn't hurry into commercialization, what I've noticed is that the fund that usually funders um, are, you, are more interested, especially when they, they're funding um, in African countries, they're more interested in product-driven proposals. So somehow you have to talk about a product and how you're going to commercialize it and all that. I know they don't understand you know, the pathway, the process that, the, the process within the pathway, but that's all they want to hear. So um, that's why I think, I don't know if it's just being fake here, where you just sort of put it out there, I'll have a product and, you know, get it to commercialization. And once you get the funding, you find that now you see, <laughs> you can't even, you can't even, you can't even complete just the basics. So- yeah, Rita, Rita, maybe on that point, eh? <clears throat> I think what you are saying is true. Everybody wants a product, but actually there is always a, a process to everything. So in as much as we are looking at the end product, even writing a proposal, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there must be a product to be commercialized. What about if the product does not, uh, you don't produce the product, so you have not. Okay, Prof. Uh, Dr. Tonga, let me head out to Angela. Angela, we can hear your view. Yes, um, I think from my opinion with the project that we work with, because we work with the IDRC and UK Aid. Uh, Dr. Rita? Yes, please, I can hear you. So uh, the only um, thing I can say in this is that, yes, they wanted a product, but sometimes you have other collaborations coming in within a project that can help you test on pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of a phage. Because some people want you to have already the phage and then it's just aligning yourself where if, for example, you've characterized and you've done and you have like, like 10 phages. So we have a lot of people jumping in and said, okay, fine, you have a product and if you're willing to do, and that's the big pharma now saying pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And in terms of collaboration, I think we, if I'm collaborating with Martha, who's all in UK, so we have a mutual understanding when it comes from phages from our lab to her lab and vice versa. So I think people should also be thinking about that because you can exchange phages and maybe theirs are going to work better than ours and ours will work better in a situation. So we try to exchange a lot of information, but also try to understand how far the research can go in terms of the material that we give. 
yeah. Yeah, that is correct. Um, for the sake of time, let me qu quickly, can we hear from you, Belinda? Belinda is raised up. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, I want to appreciate this uh, African Page Forum for the symposium. I'm um, speaking on behalf of the upcoming scientists and uh, those of our university students right now. And I really believe this is a good platform that we can learn and we can improve ourselves from. And uh, speaking of collaborations, uh, some some students or some of us, we've, we've gone out, like uh, for me personally, I've gone to China, learned much on page biology, but coming back here or coming back to Africa, we need to be in contact or in touch with uh, scientists here. And and also speaking of collaborations, uh, young scientists can, can really bring good collaborations from different or, or various places they study, for example, China, Japan, or in the UK. So I think it's a good, platform and I I give a round of applause to the do this program. Oh thank you Belinda. I think that's why African Faith Forum was formed so that we can have that um, network among us. Um Jilani, so you could quickly give us your a way forward for you know the forum. Thank you Rita for <clears throat> giving me this opportunity. I simply applaud this kind of uh, <clears throat> platform is the best way forward. And I wanted to comment on something to do with uh, the collaborations and the MTAs, because that's where we would always be going. Two things to it. <clears throat> um, when you're looking at genetic material, you're looking at uh, uh, conforming to the Kyoto Protocol. Most of the time, this is biological material residents with communities. And of course, there's a whole lot of things. Dr. Tunga can attest to how we go through our processes <clears throat> to engage and then get the MTAs around. And MTAs will be the best way forward for collaborations. My suggestion would be, and we were trying to do this in our second phase meeting in uh, Kilifi at Pony University, where we're engaging <coughs> the uh, the, the stakeholders, those are now the protocol holders in government. One, <clears throat> we were almost forming an in-country phage workers because then you, you have a voice and going by what the Prof Nakavuma was saying, you have a voice in terms of, this is how we want the process to go uh, in generating the MTS. And so, if we went country by country, if we would have people that are working on phages, identifying themselves and approaching government or the government agencies responsible for these permissions and licenses, we would actually be making that one step. Then we would perhaps get into say the East African region. So that Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya would say, this is how we want to collaborate. Can such things be perhaps changed for our favor or in our favor? Um, but that's the longest bit of it, which perhaps we would want to do. The other alternative to collaborations at the MTS is simply to work with students, where a student then goes to, say, Matakloski's uh, lab and carries the phage with them. And I don't think the rigor will be equal to us like from IPR sending the phages to Martha Clock's lab, because then the MTAs must come up and come out clearly on how, what, who, where, those kind of things. And, and that was uh, what I wanted to say. Oh, thank you so much, Jala. I mean, you, you touch on we creating those um, conversations with the government and that is quite work and also streamlining on the MTS. And also something maybe that was so nice to hear is, you know, students and then maybe sending them off. I'll give an example to Martha Clocky's lab. I hope Prof, your lab is not full <laughs> with students because we might <laughs> have these many students just knocking on your door. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. that was something that was quite interesting to, you know, to listen to and yeah. 
from yeah, my home. You're, you're always, of course, most, most, most welcome. Um, my lab is <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome visitors who currently we have a lovely young Mexican in the lab. We welcome people from ev everywhere who want to. <laughs> We might be overwhelmed with students, all of us carrying our pages and coming knocking. <laughs> anyway, we'll see that. But anyway, those are some of the highlights. Yeah, but I think I think what you think what you are talking about, you know, what what you have is a <laughs> note in can you unmute us? Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, I mean, ha having the unique resource that you've gathered and started to characterize, when, once you have that, uh, then that's, hopefully that can act as leverage in terms of, you know, incre in increasing interest from the, um, uh, as Jelani said, the sort of policy makers and the people who are funding, because there's something, in order to take a commercial product that has to forward, there has to be something that's sort of protectable and yours. And I think, yeah. and I think some, some are sort of look, looking after that and using it as a, um it, 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 it's it's important to be aware of that but also i think people have got their own specific needs so for example you know if you develop a banana product rita for the bananas in uganda that's that's going to that, <laughs> that that's probably going to be a different a different product will be needed if probably even for bananas in other african countries because there'll be different yeah, that's um you know, different strains and things that are, are, are there that's so correct thank you prof um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, I think from uh, Dr. Janet Nale, she says that there's need to build up our phage resources and sufficient data to attract funding and collaboration. So members, please, um, I think we cannot talk about collaboration before we actually do some work. So I think we have to do some work. I know there's work ongoing there, but I think um, as we move along, I guess uh, it will be very nice to hear very, you know, more of us talk about our works and so that you know, you know, everyone else, you know, the whole continent can can, I mean, the whole world can can hear what you do, and therefore you can attract collaborations and funding and all those sorts of things. Someone okay. Yes. Lillian, Lillian, maybe you'll be the last one and then we shall close the meeting. I think we are far behind time. Olivia, yes, um, thank you so much, moderator. You. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, please. Uh, this is Dr. Mosello from Camry. Um, I just had a, a number of suggestions. Uh, the first is, um, as we uh, perhaps invite another training in Africa, I think the next level of training that we should have is um, training on genome analysis of phages. Um, the talk that we heard um, on the, the first day, I thought was so informative. And I think that's where we need to move towards because I think uh, we're beginning to have access to more uh, genome sequencing platforms. And the gap then is, is what we do with all that sequencing data. So I think that would be my proposal for the next, um, the next uh, training that's based in Africa. Uh, the other bottleneck that we've experienced in our, in our phage team here is how to move from just in, in vitro tests into in vivo models. Um, and we've been trying to establish the Galleria um, lava model that uh, many people have presented here because it's, it's, it's much simpler than the mouse model, which we really struggled to establish uh, to make that leap from in vitro to in vivo. So I think one of the things that I would be quite interested in doing is to establish a, a, a colony here in Camry that could be a common resource, uh, particularly for people within the Kenya region. I don't know if anybody is already well established in that model that we could consult, but I think that would help us move from just a theoretical analysis of phages in the lab into more, more, more proof of principle in vivo model testings. And perhaps Prof Kroke uh, can give her, um, her experience in how easy or difficult it is to establish that model. I think my third uh, and final point is that I think many of us suffer from having very, very small, um, small phage projects. And one of the ideas that we've, been, uh, that we've been wrestling with quite seriously is to establish phage banks where we can consolidate all these small projects. And then from that bank, then we can attract larger scale funding that would help us move a lot of these phages into closer to application. But it would also allow us then to establish common protocols 
and then possibly also common MTAs for how to share those pages with other collaborators. So I think those are some of the ideas that will help us take, I think, the next necessary steps and move us closer to where we all want to be, which is um, at the product level. But thank you so much and back to you, moderator. Yeah, thank you so much, Lillian. I mean, I can't even re echo what you have said. And um, some of the things like um, phage banks, that is something that, you know, we've not had once or twice. Um, but anyway, like all baby steps, it's always one step at a time. But um, um, I guess, like you say, these are all things that we shall put into writing and then we sit as African Fade Forum. So I want to thank you so much for all your, for the feedback that you've given. Surely, because now it, had, it has been more of, um, these have been sort of like worldly views where it's not just, you know, the members, but also um, 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 uh, distinguished, you know, speakers and also guests from elsewhere, from other than Africa, so that we get to hear, to, to hear from them and know where, where can we go next? You know, we have, we think that, you know, we, we've done what we can, you know, we've, we've given out, we've, we, we've had the webinars, we've had the knowledge, but it's time to work. It's time to work towards, you know, something, something bigger than just being on the listening side. Um, so I, I welcome and I thank you so much for all this, this um, your feedback, which we will definitely put in, try, try, uh, in writing and then, and, and then work on the implementation, which is the hardest, but we will definitely do that as African, you know, phage forum. Um, I think as for now, I will, I will ask Nautin to take over and probably close today's meeting.